Welcome to the programme. Very good to have your company. You know, this week marks 30 years since the fall of the Berlin Wall. The most memorable moment, they say, in the collapse of European communism that in turn, perhaps, also brought about an end to the Cold War. But a generation on, what has been learned from it all? You're watching Roundtable. Good to have your company, David Foster here. On a cold November night in 1989, the warm embraces among crowds of strangers signalled one of the 20th century's most historic moments. The Berlin Wall was coming down and Soviet communism was about to be demolished as well. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, Tear down this wall. With those words, U.S. leader Ronald Reagan called on a Soviet counterpart, Mikhail Gorbachev, to open the Berlin Wall. A wall that served not only as a physical barrier, but an ideological divide between the democratic West and communist East. Two years later, the wall did come down, and with it, the collapse of the Soviet ideology. For some, the fall of the wall symbolized freedom. For others, the end of a common cause that united much of Eastern Europe. The past 30 years since have seen the fall of communism, the rise of capitalism, but was it all for the best? Let us get talking. We have Kurt Barling with us, who was one of the first broadcasters into East Berlin at that time, and who wrote a forward to the book Darkness Over Germany, has family still in that country. We also have... Bert Krumin, history professor at the University of Warwick, who visited the old East Germany and has been back on other occasions, and Dr. Luc-André Brunet from the Cold War Studies program at the London School of Economics. Uh, Jean-Luc, I'll bring you in, oh, Luc-André, I'll bring you in in just a moment, if I may, to talk about the Cold War side of this. But let's go back to what seems like a different century rather than just 30 years ago. Um, East Germany at that time was, was the darkest, dankest place you could imagine. It was a very grey spot. I mean, you used to go through, through Checkpoint Charlie, as most people will know, as a Westerner, into East Berlin. And the first thing that struck you was how colourless the place was. Not only was it colourless, there were people watching you. Uh, and for a Westerner, it, you had a sort of uncomfortable feeling walking around in East Berlin. You could virtually afford nothing there because... Um, things were when you changed over your West German marks into East German marks, you didn't get a fair exchange. You ended up um, buying some books and bringing them back because it seemed the best value. Uh, but actually, it was a place that made you feel very uncomfortable. Whereas West Berlin was like a playground for Westerners, you know, lots of Germans who didn't want to play by the rules, ended up in West Berlin. So had that kind of um, bohemian uh, ambiance. For those that don't remember the history or the geography of this, it was the strangest thing, wasn't it? It was one city divided in, in well, split, and it was a country also split, but split elsewhere. So you had East German, West German border. Then you had Berlin in the middle of all of this, and that was also split. So if you were a Berliner, did you almost feel, do you think, at the time, as if you were not part of the real world? It was an odd little island in the middle of everything, yeah? People um, were very much aware they were in a special situation. It was also an interesting uh, congregation of people with all sorts of different views. It was like a special habitat where they could flourish, a thousand flowers could flourish, yeah? And then, as you said, you went across these checkpoints and it was like another world. Uh, the only thing you did see on posters was like uh, slogans about the party and the, and, and the progress of the future, etc. But on the other hand, you also saw people with some real enthusiasm, you know, people with some real um, um, feeling that they were creating another society. So for us, it was, it was almost strange to see that they were, you know, believing to a certain extent in that project and trying to make something work that hadn't worked in the past and felt very much that the, the sort of people in the West were trying mm. to stop them from achieving And I that. will bring up the film that you made at the time. Uh, because there was an interesting comment in this about how they felt they had a co cohesive society, whereas the West, with its liberal values, perhaps was falling apart. I'll talk about that in a moment, if I may. But let's talk about whether this brought about 
the end of the Cold War because the suggestion is that Mikhail Gorbachev, then the, the Soviet president of the time, was quite prepared for this to happen and ordered his troops not to, ret to, to take any action whatsoever. Was the Soviet Union falling apart so rapidly that this was inevitable? So the Cold War was not necessarily brought about by this. This was just part of the end of the Cold War. Well, I think it's important to distinguish between um, the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union. So the Soviet Union, of course, remained in place until December 1991. Uh, and I think the, the end of the Cold War, we really look at the, the fall of the Berlin Wall as, as the turning point in all of this. I think the key decision on the Soviet uh, side was to not intervene militarily. So unlike in East Germany in 1953, in Hungary in 1956, in Czech, uh, Czechoslovakia in 1968, um, here the Soviets don't send in the troops. But I'm wondering if this is because the Soviet Union was already so financially um, falling apart that it couldn't afford to do this, or the will was no longer there for the Soviet system to stay in place? Well, I think the, uh, I mean, the changes of, of glasnost and perestroika that had been ushered in from Gorbachev since his arrival in March 1985 had really changed the tone in the Soviet Union. I think he was trying to, to sell the Soviet Union in a different kind of way. This is a period when Gorbachev was talking about the, the common European home, which would inc incorporate both Western and Eastern Europe. And I think sending in the troops would have brought a, a complete end to that, as well as the other forms of progress and dialogue uh, achieved by Gorbachev, so notably the 1987. It wasn't in any way to do with the fact that the United States had also attempted to, to bankrupt the Soviet Union by taking it on an arms race that it could not afford. Well, I think that was uh, perhaps indirectly. I think that may or may not, historians still debate this quite, uh, quite hotly, but I think that may have been an influence on Gorbachev's broader policy of, of closer cooperation with the West. Um, and then that, in turn, uh, would have informed the decision. I think you shouldn't regarding... forget that Gorbachev was an extraordinary individual. I mean, and actually, the thing that I took away from going to Berlin in 1989 was you that... You were there within days, weren't you? The following day, following after day. the wall had opened. Yeah. And what you have to remember, that we very much felt that things could not change. We always live in, a, in a, an environment where we think it's very difficult for change to happen. But actually, people make change happen. And in this case, Gorbachev very much was a man who made change happen, first in his own society, but also recognised the importance of what he was doing with his own society for others beyond the traditional border. And as a consequence of that, he set in motion um, a, a whole set of changes which... It didn't make it inevitable that the wall came down, mm. but it encouraged and liberated people to feel that they could make change happen. And DDR, people in East Germany, really believed at that point they could make change Wonderful happen. Wonderful name, wasn't it? German Democratic Republic. Democratic. Yeah. I, I, can, I, can I just say something? I've sometimes wondered whether when Ronald Reagan said, Mr Gorbachev, tear down that wall, he had, in fact, been fed inside information by Mr Gorbachev that... That might not be such a bad thing to say, because that's what he was thinking of doing anyway. Yeah, I think I mean a really telling moment was when when Gorbachev visited um, East Berlin for the 40th anniversary of the GDR, and you know he came in with all this sort of um, enthusiasm about change and reform, and he encountered the East European, the Eastern German elite who were really didn't want anything of that. Yeah, so they were trying to celebrate their 40th anniversary, as if nothing had changed and if nothing around them was, was and those, sort those of transition. Elite, were they just the politically powerful, the, the rich industrialists, if there were well, any, um, any then? In the or palace was it the, the general populace of a country? I mean, it, it was, it was bizarre. Doing? There was the Palace of the Republic, yeah, where, where, they, were, where they were sort of toasting with, with, with sort of cream sect and, and, and all kinds of, of uh, delicacies. And around them, there was like a menacing group of people who were pushing for change, you could actually hear it. Some of the documentaries, you can hear the noise from outside the Palace of the Republic, of the Palace of the Republic coming in. And inside, you know, Honecker was making his speeches about the future of the GDR and how it would all be. The Eastern Germans saw themselves as the stalwarts of, you know, the Eastern Bloc because the Russians had somehow, the Soviets had somehow abandoned the right route and the East Germans were still there and, you know, um, upholding all the principles. And that was a really just go crucial ahead, moment. Come back to you, um, in, in terms of the immediate aftermath of the fall of the Berlin Wall and, and, and then the reunification of Germany just, well, not, not that long afterwards, um, and the eventual end of the, the Cold War, uh, Soviet Union as, as such, um, what were the biggest ripples felt from that, do you think, not just within the countries themselves but also outside to the world at large? 
Well, certainly, I mean, in the, among other Warsaw Pact countries, I think the, the fact that the Berlin Wall could peacefully come down certainly gave further impetus to, uh, to other movements, which were already underway at this point. We see, um, I mean, there were elections in Poland uh, in June 1989. There was the, the cutting of the wire at the, the Hungarian border with Austria. But by the end of 1989, virtually all the, the regimes in Eastern Europe had come to an end. And I think more broadly, um, this, uh, this allowed, I suppose, um, the, the former Warsaw Pact uh, countries to ultimately be incorporated into, uh, into the West, so beginning with the GDR, of course, with the reunification, uh, which was realized in October 1990, so less than a year, um, or almost a year to the day after the, the 40th anniversary of the GDR, which had been uh, celebrated. So things were moving incredibly quickly. But I think what followed is an incorporation of Eastern Europe into Western uh, institutions, which we see continuing uh, in the following decades with uh, integration and I'm going into to ask the European in fact, Union, into like, NATO. Yeah, but a bit like mixing oil and water, that they're trying to integrate two different peoples within one that's, country. I mean, that's one part of the story, of course, and it wasn't just a European story, it was a global story. Because once the Soviet Union fell, it meant that the regimes that they supported elsewhere also came under pressure. So in North Africa, in Maghreb, the regime came under pressure in Algeria very quickly. And what did you see? Suddenly you saw these movements emerging, which have come back to haunt us subsequently. If you think of the Islamist movement, which emerged uh, in Algeria after the fall of the Soviet Union, very quickly there was a civil war there. And what happened in that civil war? Um, people from the jihadist movement decided to bomb Paris. They decided to take their conflict uh, to the old imperial power. So it unleashed all kinds of forces. So whereas it was a very positive and optimistic uh, force in Europe, it actually unleashed other forces elsewhere around the world, which we've actually found it very difficult well, to contain. I, I've made this note to myself here on this pad that says, would it perhaps have been easier if things had remained as it was, the Soviet Union and a bit of containment? I think there was a, a lot of, of, of hope about improvement and about betterment. There was, a, there was a real enthusiasm in these first few days. There was a sort of a general outpouring of, of relief and of, it was nonviolent, you know, which I think was a very, a big, big thing because this could have so easily turned into a very, very nasty international conflict. So people were relieved, flabbergasted, optimistic. But I think in the, in the medium and longer run, they also started to feel a little bit taken over. Yeah? They started to feel a little bit um, um, Do you mean the East, Ger East German people? East German people, people exactly. Used communism in Poland, etc., etc. They, they felt they were like they were having somebody else's way of life imposed upon exactly. them. Exactly. They, they had some things, obviously there were many things that they resented, but they had some things they felt you know, they had achieved, like um, in terms of workers' rights or in terms of you know, job security, or in terms of a certain collective spirit about it all. And here, it was all swept aside. And I think that that feeds into a certain amount of nostalgia, which is um, strange, I guess, when you look at how they thought at the time. But I think it's mm. been very abrupt and it's been very imposed. And I think it, it, they just feel nothing of them has remained. Okay, yeah? so, so some of them feel like perhaps they've been shortchanged, that the, the dream wasn't actually there. But look, Andre, um, Kurt was talking about the fact that it sent ripples around the world um, over, over the next few years. And, and what I was wondering, uh, to some extent, is would it perhaps have been easier for the West if things had stayed the same? You know where you are, these forces are contained, and they're not really giving you a lot of trouble. Well, I think initially, certainly, uh, the, uh, the Bush administration, uh, George H.W. Bush, Bush uh, at the time, Bush won, um, I mean, he was initially quite concerned at just how rapidly things were falling apart. He'd finally reached quite a, a good modus vivendi with, uh, with Gorbachev, with the Kremlin. Uh, in December 1989, they, uh, they, they declared effectively that the Cold War was over. So seeing this stable, reliable partner in the Soviet Union collapse was certainly quite worrying initially from the American uh, perspective because it led to, to something completely unknown. Well, and, and from that, we saw the enlargement of NATO. Uh, which infuriated Russia because it meant that Western forces were coming closer to its border. Uh, we, we saw the enlargement of the European Union with taking in the former Warsaw Pact countries. Uh, I mean, again, the, the, the ripples from this were, were, were very strong indeed. Still being felt today? 
Yes, well, I think it's important to note, first of all, that uh, membership in NATO, membership of the European Union, uh, I mean, th these are voluntary. So it's the governments of Eastern, uh, Eastern Europe, the former Warsaw Pact countries, that elected to join these, uh, these organizations. But certainly but from... It's still it still really hacked Russia off about the, the NATO membership for sure. Certainly, and, and this was not done uh, with, with Russian consent. Uh, and, and so I think from uh, Russia, the Russian perspective, seeing parts of its traditional sphere of influence, uh, including I mean, in the Baltic states, parts of the former uh, Soviet Union, being incorporated into these Western uh, alliances and Western European institutions, um, I think has, has caused uh, alarm and, and to some extent explains uh, the actions taken in well, Ukraine in, in 2014. By asking the question, though, you do presuppose that the Western governments had any choice in the matter. And the reality is we forget those pictures in the run-up to the fall of the wall in early 1989 where people were voting with their feet. If they hadn't, re if they hadn't reacted in the way they did, East Germany would have been an empty vessel. Most people would have left or at least most families would have been uh, found that many of their members would have left. And therefore, it would have been a broken society anyway. People were coming across the border in their thousands into... We forget, you know, we talk about refugees now. We talk about the migrant crisis now. In 1989, June, July, August, September, there was a real migrant crisis in Germany. Of course, we didn't call it migrants because there were people coming from East Germany into West Germany, and they were housed in tents, and there were tent cities everywhere. They didn't have a choice. They had to, uh, in a way, go with the flow of the people. And once the wall opened, there was nothing. You can't... It's like letting a genie out of the bottle. Once it's out, you can't put it back. And about it being better for the West, you know, we lived under a real cloud in the 1980s about, you know, the possibility of, of nuclear war. There was a massive armament. There were, you know, powerful medium-range missiles on both sides of the border. Any sort of spark one feared could have lit that flame. So, so that sort of psychologically, I think that was a very uh, big burden to, to bear. And this presented the opportunity to perhaps lift that burden. And from that psychological perspective, and yet, it was this is, this is a wide open question. It did not lead to a lasting triumph for the West, as perhaps no, no. had been envisaged. No, I think, I mean, as, as has already been said, I mean, 1989, 1991 was a time of incredible optimism. I think the peaceful revolutions of 1989 was one part of this. I mean, we see, for example, in, in uh, the first Gulf War, um, an international coalition coming together under a UN mandate to enforce international law in which Soviet and American forces are both on the same side. Uh, we see at the very uh, dawn of the 1990s the dismantling of the apartheid regime in South Africa. So this seems like a, a very promising, hopeful period that's going to be characterized by the onward march of uh, human rights, of liberal democ democracy, of market capitalism. Um, and I think that endures for a number of years uh, for various reasons with 9-11, uh, with the economic crash and so on. We've seen that optimism, uh, I think, change towards pessimism. And, and that's why we're seeing... Uh, some examples of uh, what we might call democratic backsliding. Or, or perhaps it is, of the, it is the destruction war. of the, the idea that um, what some of the people that you interviewed in your documentary had of, of the fellowship that they had as being part of these warsaw Pact countries, their, their communities being destroyed, that in the end they, they didn't get anything at all. They may have got a nicer, more comfortable bed and a, a slightly larger wage, but their communities were destroyed. Uh, I think that's a, uh, that's a step too far to say that. I think that actually... Well, this, these, words, these weren't your words or my words. No, but was, uh, we have a very high spirit of fellowship Germans that we should were, not lose. In that film, yeah. it was shot in the week following the fall of the wall, were kind of hedging their bets. They weren't sure this was permanent. Nobody was sure it was permanent. It was quite easy for troops to come onto the streets. That's the way people perceived it. So in that film, they were hedging their best. It showed you how volatile the situation... So it was self-preservation, was it? Yeah, and it, okay. it showed you that it, 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 the situation wasn't a done deal. It could be undone. It could be undone by a whole range of different things. But I agree with my fellow panellists that actually this was a moment of incredible optimism. Uh, I was born in the year the war was put up. I believed it could never be put down. My father, who came from Nuremberg, believed it would never come down. But it came down. So people were really optimistic. And that optimism pretty much lasted until 9-11. And suddenly, 9-11, people started to ask themselves a the question, how have we got here? Well, we've got here because we unleashed all these forces 
that actually we kind of ignored, despite Gulf Wars, we kind of ignored the impact that we've had on all those people. And now it's coming back to us. Now it's the feedback. And the feedback has left us with a sense of insecurity, uncertainty, and even pessimism. Did you about... ever get a chance to talk to the... This, she was a Lutheran pastor, wasn't she? Yeah. That you spoke to. Yeah. A clergywoman in East Germany, who I, I think you told me, she then became the last... East German ambassador to the United Kingdom Correct. before reunification. Did you ever get a chance to talk to her again? Absolutely. And, and what did she tell and you I've, about I've what talked was to happening? her in the last in the last couple of years. Yeah. And her feeling is that something was lost of the Ost East Germany, this sense of solidarity. Of course, it was solidarity under adversity in many situations. You know, people are listening to them. People compulsory are, solidarity. Not compulsory. It's never compulsory. <clears> but the fact that you, we're under in this regime which is um, oppressive, and actually we can only get through it by having those feelings of solidarity. But of course, you're quite right. There were workers' rights. Women could go to work, and they, their children would be looked after. So, was a sense that that something had been achieved in East Germany. And the danger was when the West German constitution came and the West German culture came and the West German way of life came, people felt, well, we shouldn't throw everything away. We need to retain something. If we don't retain something, it's as if our lives have been worthless for 40 years. Are, are we seeing nowadays the erection of more um, monuments to division, such as what Trump is doing with the with the, um, I think it, the wall in Mexico, what we're seeing perhaps yeah. in Hungary yeah. with the, the right-wing populist movements in Italy, et cetera, et cetera. People are more divided than they were then. Well, in, in, in the West, some intellectuals said it was the end of history. Yeah. <laughs> there was a famous sort of phrase that uh, 1992, Francis Fukuyama, we, we've reached the end of the road, you know, we've, we've reached our sort of ultimate destination of Western liberal democracy and its triumph, the triumph of the West. But that forgot that historically Europe was always divided. Yeah, It's actually a very evasive idea to bring Europe under one umbrella. It used to be religion that divided people. It used to be you know, continent, nationalism. Continent of na nation states all over. It, place, exactly. Right? So the idea that somehow this had reached an end point and all the divisions and conflicts of interest would go away was illusionary. And now we're seeing migration as a big topic. We see climate change as a big topic. We see almost 50% or more than 50% of this country uh, wanting to loosen, you know, ties to Europe again and, and orientate themselves into another direction, going, uh, you know, forging different kinds of alliances. So the end of history in Europe yeah. definitely didn't happen. I'm wondering if since 1989 there has been a certain arrogance that this having been achieved, the end of history, uh, as, as you mentioned, that was about all that needed to be done. Well, I think the, I mean, it's important to remember that the European Union, uh, I mean, it's part of this uh, wave of optimism in the early 1990s with the Maastricht Treaty and the creation of the European Union from the European community in 1992-93. And there was this idea that we could not only deepen uh, European institutions, but also to enlarge and broaden it to, to include the whole, uh, the whole continent. And I think from the Eastern European perspective, I think there was this expectation that within a few short years, uh, they'd come to enjoy the, the same standard of living, the same democratic institutions, and so on, that were seen in the West. Uh, the promise held out in 1989 wasn't realized in quite the same way that and, people and had expected who's, at the Whose fault, time. at whose feet would the blame for that lie? Uh, is is there somewhere you can say, this is what we should have done? I think there's a regional dimension to this. When you go to Eastern Germany these days, you see some very dynamic areas. Yeah? You see some of the big cities like Dresden and Leipzig, uh, flourishing, and then you go to the sort of plains of Mecklenburg and Pomerania, and you're shocked at the depopulation there. Yeah, so these people really feel there is no opportunity here. We have to go. There's a brain drain of all the young people. Uh, so you walk around some of the smaller market towns in in Pomerania, and you see boarded up high streets. You see democracy shops where the governments are trying to say, "Look, this is actually a good thing. What's happened here?" So I think there's a lot of of, of divergence and polarization within the former East, which doesn't help the feeling of, you know, um, enthusiasm or, or optimism that 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 was that um, that was so prominent in in 1989 and 1990. Okay, so maybe we can in the last minute or so try and answer why that has happened. But let me just put something to you. You wrote an article in which you you ended it by saying, with regards to what you'd seen in East Germany, uh, if you want to, this shows that you can change the world. I, is that really true? Yeah, I think so. I mean, in the end, you've got to be careful what you wish for, but we are agents of our own uh, future 
it's, it, it would be wrong to suggest that people, ordinary people, cannot change the world. And all the populist movements now play to that idea that actually, if we engage, you might agree or disagree with those populist movements, but the reality is, if people want to engage with politics, they can make change happen. And the fact of the matter is, in 1989, people were voting with their feet to leave East Germany, and that's why that change happened. And don't forget, in the run-up to the, the weeks before, there were marches, even when people weren't sure whether they were going to get shot dead. People took the action to the streets, and those peaceful revolutions happened because people made it happen. It was the first lesson I learned in journalism, and it stuck with me, and it will stay with me. Okay. Thank you. I've, I've got to stop here. OK. Yeah, yeah. It was only up for 28 years. We've right. only had roughly <laughs> half an hour. I'm afraid that's all the time we have. Uh, we shall see what the next 30 years brings for the continent of Europe and the wider world as well. For me, David Foster, for my guests on Roundtable, thank you for taking part in this debate and thank you very much for watching. Hope to have your company next time. Goodbye for now.